Thank you, Lisa. Welcome. It's great to see you all. And thank you for those of us online. Uh, amidst this chapel series about lamentation, it's fitting that we start with a land acknowledgement. As a community who strives to love God and neighbor, we lament the ways that we have participated in harm. We commit to reconciliation and repair along with the Coast Salish peoples as we continue to learn to care for this ceded and unceded land. And one of the ways we can do that is working together on climate change, our topic today. I actually have an amazing success story, and if you want to hear about it, ask in the Q&A. Um, but as a sustainability manager here at Seattle Pacific University, part of my role is encouraging collaboration. It's essential as we face the challenges of the future. So it's great to see this collaboration with Chapel and the Faith, Diversity, and Science Lecture Series, which is sponsored by the Office of Inclusive Excellence and the Biology Department. It's a lecture series also sponsored by um, excuse me, with a grant from the Supporting Structures Innovative Partnerships to Enhance Bench Science at the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities Member Institutions. This is supported by Scholarship in Christianity in Oxford with funding from the John Templeton Foundation and the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust. Our thanks to them. Our guest speaker is also a great collaborator. Marcus Cole is a Public Voices Fellow with the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. He serves as the Director of Church and Community Engagement with Evangelical Environmental Network and the Youth Evangelical Climate Action. He's Community Engagement Coordinator with Grace Snellville Church in Atlanta, where he, his wife Amanda, and daughters Ava and Isabella live. In his spare time, He's a lawyer <laughs> who trained at the Shiver Center on Poverty Law. He owns, holds a Juris Doctorate from DePaul and Bachelor's Degree in Political Science from Georgia State University. Please warmly welcome Marcus Cole. Do you have anything here to eat? Now I know, I know. It's a strange question to ask considering we just heard you've been working through the Book of Lamentations. But do you have anything here to eat? It's weird because I'm here as part of the Faith, Diversity, and Science lecture series, but it is the question I have for you. Do you have anything here to eat? Now, I, knew, I know I flew all this way to give a talk that says, can I get a climate witness? But I submit to you today that that question may be the most important question that I ask you today. In fact, if you were to turn in the scripture to Luke 24, towards the end, you would see the crucified Messiah, the dead three-day Son of Man, the risen and resurrected Son of God, ask no less a startling question. In Hebrew, in the language Hebrew, the title of the book of Lamentations is Akah, that is how. That's how the scroll opens. How did Jerusalem fall? How was the temple destroyed? How are things so despondent and broken? That's the question that they're asking and they're lamenting. And so when we open Luke 24, we see that same question, how? Women wondering and wandering, how can the, t the tomb be empty? Travelers on the road asking, how can Jesus be the Messiah when he was crucified? Disciples in an upper room, like this upper room, startled, frightened, afraid with doubts in their mind, asking, how? How can Jesus be here? When the people of God are lamenting, God steps in with his promise and performance. Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. New creation, creation, the presence of the Lord and his followers. 
To ask the question, do you have anything here to eat, is to ask the question, can I get a witness? It's to invoke this very episode found in scripture. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for being here in person in the room. Thank you for joining online. Thank you even for going back to watch the recording later to figure out why I started with that question. We'll get there. It's true I'm a Public Voices Fellow with the Op-Ed Project in partnership with Yale. It's true that I serve the local community and the local body at a church in Grace Snellville. It's especially true that I serve my wife, my seven-year-old, and my four-year-old, including our miniature schnauzer, Lily. I do a lot of service. But I also exist to honor and serve God. And I do that by revealing shalom. And what that means to me and what that looks like in my life is going into broken places and broken spaces and meeting with broken faces. It's a lot of alliteration, I know, but I'm preaching. You'll bear with me. To make new creation the extraordinary norm. Why do I bring that up? Because the template, the model, the best example that I've ever found in this is the new creation Jesus in creation in an upper room with his followers eating and opening the word together. So with your permission today, SPU, I'd love to do the same. This season of my life started with that question, how? Now, now I have the opportunity to write and to be published, to have my work featured by other writers, to be on podcast. All of that is really cool, but it wasn't always the case. How? As an evangelical Christian, as a black millennial follower of Jesus in a mostly white but diversifying congregation in the American South, we don't always talk about caring for creation or the climate crisis. In fact, my faith journey started in the Church of Christ, the Black Church of Christ, and I will tell you we were not environmentalists or tree huggers. But, but my faith tradition did color how I saw faith, diversity, science, and justice. And I've come to believe that in our day and time, SPU, to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with the Lord our God requires us to engage directly with the twin realities of racial injustice and environmental injustice. In fact, I've been told here at SPU that you are fully committed to engaging the culture and changing the world, and I commend you for that. But but what I would say along with that is that we can't engage the culture on its own terms and in its own ways. In fact, in our day and time, we have to bring biblical justice into the conversation with racial justice and environmental justice. In fact, I would go so far to say that our silence in the face of injustice as a church has oftentimes testified against us. That no, we need not speak on everything everywhere, but if we speak on nothing nowhere, we've said all we need to say, and we bear the name in vain. But how? There's that question again. For me, it was at an evangelical conference some years ago where my now colleague and friend, Dr. Jessica Mormon, came to talk about Christians and why they should care about the climate crisis. Yes, she brought scripture, she brought science, she talked about social action, but maybe the most important thing that my friend Jessica did was came and brought a credible witness. I admit that at the time, I cared about the climate crisis as a person, but I didn't know that as a Christian, I could care or that I should care. I felt alone before that day. I didn't know how how to reconcile my faith, my values, and maybe most importantly, the lack of a witness in my community on this issue. I would oftentimes wonder who cares. But in the book of Lamentations, we find that our response to lament is to, quote, wait for him. Yahweh is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of Yahweh, that is the Lord. And so into creation steps, Yeshua, Yahweh is salvation. That is the new creation man, Jesus. And as he says in Luke 24, what I told you while I was still with you, everything, that's everything, SPU, must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. 
So yes, that includes the book of Lamentations you've been working through. And he goes on to say in Luke 24, if you were to keep reading, that it was written that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. That's ethne, and we could talk about that, but I'm not going to. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses to these things. Did you catch that? Witnesses. Now, I know I'm doing a lot of scripture here, but I just want to let you know the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians reminds his brothers and sisters that Jesus appeared to Peter and then to the 12, after that appearing to more than 500 of the brothers in the same time, most of whom were still alive at that time, though some had fallen asleep. He then appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and then last of all, he appeared to Paul as to one abnormally born. So again, did you catch that? Those are witnesses. In fact, I would submit to you that the gospel that each and every one of us has received, which we take our stand on, the gospel by which we are saved and hold firmly to, is tied to a chain of witnesses. It's from disciple to disciple. It's from the revelation of the written scripture that comes from the revelation of the revealed Jesus to witnesses experiencing new creation, crashing into creation with this simple question, SPU, do you have anything here to eat? God's ultimate response to lament is a living hope in the resurrection. It's new creation. So before we can determine if we can get a climate witness, we first need to investigate who even cares about creation. So let's start by naming reality. What do we call in our society a person who cares about creation in the climate crisis? This isn't a rhetorical question. I come from a tradition where people talk back. It's okay to talk back to me today. I know you can online. That's okay. What do we call a person? A tree hugger. What else? What do we call a person? Environmentalist. A green. A liberal. Those scary liberals. A progressive. A Democrat. What if we called them a Christian? Well, unfortunately, in the past 40 years or so, many Christians in America have forgotten that Scripture has a lot to say about caring for creation. In fact, a whole generation has lost, been lost in the wilderness. And so it's for you all here, SPU, the next generation, to remember and to usher us back into what we were always supposed to be doing. To remember that creation is a theme woven through the entirety of Scripture from the Torah to the prophets and the writings. It opens several gospel accounts and the epistles return to the motif. In fact, in Revelation, it culminates in an image of new creation, new heaven and new earth eternally merged. You might not know this, but the picture on the puzzle box at the end of time is not us being disembodied ghosts playing guitars on clouds. In fact, I love how Pastor Rich Velotis says that he explains it like this. The Bible doesn't end with souls ascending to a disembodied heaven. It ends with a fully embodied heaven descending to earth. The resurrection is the good news that God in Christ is committed to the renewal, reconciliation, and resurrection of all things. And so should his church be. So, yes, we lament. We lament the broken state of the world and our relationships in it with one another, with institutions and systems, even with death. But as Paul reminds us in that first letter to Corinth, through the church in Corinth, Jesus has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So it's important to remember today, whether you're watching online or you're here in person, that God's response to our lament is hope in resurrection, in new creation. So in some ways, you could say that the story of all scripture is God's people in God's presence in God's place. We could look in the garden. We could look at Sinai. We could look in the promised land. We could look in the upper room. We could even go to the end and look in new creation. But the picture of right relationship with God is always faithful people in God's holy presence in God's promised place. That's a lot of alliteration. Did you get that? It's God's people in God's presence in God's place. I love this image of the blue marble and from the Webb telescope. They should humble us, really. The first time we as humans could observe this beauty was in a living lifetime. And yet it's always been there. It's always been enjoyed by the creator. It's just giving beauty for the sake of beauty. It's a 
witness to God's glory. And it is worth lamenting that some within the church in the West in America haven't been glorifying God when it comes to his creation. And that's the truth, isn't it? To say nothing of the secular world or capitalist culture, I often wonder if the people of God corporately could go on a cosmic field trip like Job gets to and see the vast and intimate nature of God with all of creation, would we truly be okay with the way that we live in creation? And so these 10 words that I'm about to share with you, these 10 words, they, they, they're not written in stone with the finger of God or handed down from messengers. I admit that. But these 10 words are important for us today. And it goes like this. It's real. It's bad. It's us. Experts agree. But there's hope. That's what my friends at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication say when we talk about this and communicate. Now, I had planned to come today with a neat little teaching technique. I was going to use some visuals of, of the elements of water, air, and fire to make a really cool point. I'm not going to do that because humans, our culture, makes the point for me. I was going to talk about the BP oil spill in 2010 and how it dumped oil into the water for 87 days, affecting 70,000 square miles. I had to look this up. That's the size of Oklahoma. It killed off life and destroyed opportunity for those that depend on that life for a job. In my church, so again, I'm from the South, right? We talk about this all the time. The enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. What do we say about this? Is this living water? I was going to move from water and I was going to talk about the 2012 Chevron refinery incident that poisoned the air, sending 15,000 image bearers to the hospital for respiratory distress in a California community. You want to guess the numbers on that community? 62% of them are Hispanic and black. Is that the Ruach HaKadosh? Is that the breath of life being received by those image bearers? Or is that the breath of death? I was going to talk about the wildfires ravaging the Pacific Northwest. Do you know this? I looked this up before I came. The 10 leading locations with the worst air quality in all the country last year were in the state of Washington and Oregon. That's here, preventing you from enjoying the most beautiful time of the year. We don't have to talk about hellfire at the end of time. We're living in it. Now, it isn't the point of this talk, I might add, but it's worth noting, since we did a land acknowledgement today, that the land didn't used to have this problem. In fact, the folks that were on this land originally understood that seasons of rest and, yes, burning could generate life and life abundant. See you there. Uh, the, they didn't see fire as purely destructive like their Christian conquerors. They saw life and fire as purifying and refining. And I think this controlled burning thing is interesting because I recall in the book of Malachi, this prophet, he says, who can endure the day of his coming, that being God? Who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire? Now, it's lamentable that in my line of work, what I do at EEN, I don't really need to wait very long, maybe a few days, weeks at most, for the next worst eco-disaster to happen. And so we have the train derailment in Ohio that's poisoned the air, contaminated the water, killed off life, and sent a fireball into the heavens for good measure. It's all four elements right there in one. The Book of Lamentations is a response to God's verdict against his people. Here's how his prophet Jeremiah says it. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And so we're back to lamentations and the cause for lament. It's broken relationship with God and with creation as demonstrated by the people of God allowing for rampant injustice, child sacrifice, idolatry, and forgetting the poor. Jeremiah could write that book today. Injustice defiling the land. Lamentations 
is a how. It's a how response to God's judgment through his prophet Jeremiah. Quote, I will first repay them double their iniquity and their sin because they have defiled my land. That's what God says. Lamentations is a how response to God's sentence for guilt that he reveals in Chronicles when he says, the land enjoys its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. I love this because evangelicals, I work with them every day, and they love to actually quote the prophet Jeremiah. They just don't know it. It's usually on coffee mugs and journals when they say, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. It's beautiful, but we rarely stop to consider that that's an acknowledgement and a response to lament. Lament and repentance for not giving the land its Sabbath rest, for injustice. So yes, God's ultimate plan is for resurrection life. God's response to spiritual sin is tied to and manifested in how creation and new creation come together. I love this. My, my friend, Pastor Caleb Cray Haynes, he wrote a book, Garbage Theology, and this, this, this haunts me. He says, waste at its core is something that has no value left in it. What if when we find ourselves participating in wasteful activities and overconsumption, we're actually participating in bringing a little bit of hell on earth? It's worth considering that frame when, when we think about the 2020 report that found Superfund sites, these are the most toxic places in our country, 70% of those hazardous waste sites officially listed are located within one mile one mile of federally assisted housing. Communities overwhelmingly made up of the poor, elderly, and disabled. I think it might start to explain on the bottom left there, the communities of Mott Haven and Hunts Point in the Bronx. You might not know those names, but you might know Asthma Alley. They are 97% and 98% black and Hispanic respectively. But the asthma hospitalizations are five times the national average and at rates 21 times higher than other New York City neighborhoods. To use a biblical term, those are communities with large populations of sojourners. We should probably care about that. It might start to get at the diagnosis of Cancer Alley right there on the right, an 85-mile stretch of Louisiana that has 150 petrochemical plants. I'm going to stop this for a second. I'm not good at math. I went to law school and I preach, but I know that 150 doesn't go into 85 very well. That's a lot of petrochemical plants in one community. So maybe that's why among neighborhoods with above average poverty rates there, higher levels of toxic air pollution were strongly linked to high cancer rates. Tulane just found this, an average annual cancer rate of 502 cases per 100,000 people. How many orphans and widows are we comfortable with? I, I love this quote here, St. Augustine, he says, charity is no substitute for justice withheld. James, the pillar of the church and the brother of Christ says, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. What are we showing right now? The climate crisis isn't only a creation problem, friends, it's a faith problem, it's a sin problem, it's real and it's bad. But remember, it's also us and there's hope. I love one of my uh, heroes here, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, the evangelical climate scientist. She says it this way in her book, Saving Us. The bottom line is this, scientists have known since the 1850s that carbon dioxide traps heat. Interestingly, Exxon knew as well. As early as the 1970s, we're recently finding out, they knew their products could cause, quote, dramatic environmental effects before the year 2050. It's the exact same playbook that Big Tobacco ran a generation ago, with the exact same deadly consequences and for the exact same reason, profit. Exxon scientists predicted the effects more accurately than the government scientists. It's us, it's our culture. The carbon fingerprint is an indictment against our culture. 
the release of methane as we vent and flare excess from our wells, that's our culture. Deforestation and destruction of our Earth's lungs, that's our culture. The mass extinction event that we are currently living through, that is our culture. And we have spent 40 years in the wilderness fighting a culture war against ourselves. But ultimately, because it is us, in this strange upside down kingdom of God type of way, there's hope. Because God's response to the lament of his people is a living hope. I consider the findings of author Heather McGee in her book, The Sum of Us. She says it this way. The U.S. is in many ways the problem, we know. We are the biggest carbon polluter in history, but we have one of the strongest and most politically powerful factions opposed to taking action to prevent catastrophic climate change. So it's us. But here's what's interesting. The ones doing the polluting in the political faction opposing taking action, it's probably a person you've seen Waymaker next to on Sunday. It might be your brother or your sister-in-law. It could be your parents and grandparents. It might even be some of us in this room. And that's okay because that gives me hope, as radical as that might seem. I do have a living hope. Because we are the tipping point, SPU. The tipping point on climate action in the US is us. It's our culture. And so when we lament and we repent, God responds with new creation. If our brothers and sisters in faith and our congregants and our students and our family members and our culture would lament and repent, you got to do that second part, we could tip the scales. I, I talked about working with Yale, and I know this is a little hard to see here, but I, I just want to give you this graphic. I, I really do encourage you to pursue this data on your own. It's called the Six Americas here. And I, I want you to see this. Already, those that are alarmed and concerned about the climate crisis, we are more than 50%. We are. And that's good news. There is hope. But I also want you to look at the rest of this graphic, and this is from 2021. The cautious, the disengaged, the doubtful, the dismissive, they're roughly a third of our population. And they also happen to be part of our culture. And so I want you to be thinking about this graphic. I want you to be thinking about these numbers because that's where the hope is. Do you know that the environmental justice movement was conceived, nurtured, and birthed from the womb of the bride of Christ? Do you know that? Like the early environmental justice, and I mean this, it started out of the civil rights movement. Folks like Reverend Ben Chavez and Reverend Joseph Lowry, then of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Reverend Leon White from the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice, those were witnesses. They were witnessing the impacts on the poor, the mourning, the meek, the hungry, the displaced, and the harmed. These people of God lamenting and repenting and responding with witness. That's what gives me hope. And I, I love this idea of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, and loving our neighbor. Believer and author Andreas Corellis, he notes it this way in his book, Climate Courage. In order to address the climate change, we need to cultivate different values, values that place a greater emphasis on community and less on consumption. And that living according to these values will have the benefits of reducing our impact on the planet and increasing our personal well-being. That's a call to repentance, SPU. I might add that those different values are in our shared past. SPU, we need you to be fully committed to engaging the culture and changing the world. But not because that's anything new, but because that's what the church has a history of doing. The church has always been called to care for creation because it loves the creator. God himself tells his people when he creates them as a people group at Sinai, instructing them in the year of the Sabbath and the year of the Jubilee. I, I love this image. If you've never seen this before, this is an image of the Ethiopian church force. They have a long history of stewarding and caring for the land. So as deforestation and desertification has been happening there, you get these pockets, these almost micro-Edens. 
I, I love thinking about the early history of the conservation movement here in America. It has its formation with President Roosevelt, that'd be Teddy Bear Roosevelt. He lobbied against the exploitation of nation soils and minerals, arguing that the unregulated private exploitation threatened the nation's long-term century. That's a century ago, uh, security, and that was a century ago. There's EEN where I work, there's Arosha, there's the National Association of Evangelicals. Even the Pope is getting in on the action. They actually got in first on the action. Witnesses. I'm gonna be moving towards the end here really soon, but I want you to look at my, the work of my friend Tori in YECA. She, she was out there table and she's gonna help me here in a little bit. But I just want you to see what witness can do. And this is just last year, some fellowship highlights. I want you to look at the opportunities that they're doing and that QR code's there and there's more information out in the table. But this idea of joining a movement, making an impact, gaining skills. This is often the time when I'm at churches or I'm meeting with people where they ask me, okay, Marcus, well, what do I do? I'm like, seriously, what do I do? If they made it this long with me, they, they wanna know. They feel this angst and anxiety. Have you heard this term, eco-grief? You've heard this term? Yeah, it's heavy. It's lament. And can I suggest to you that when well-meaning people ask me, what do I do? Unfortunately, oftentimes what they're looking for is ritual. They're looking to be absolved of their conviction, their complacency and complicity. But only God can forgive sins, right? I can't do that for you. And so when we find our ritual carbon offsetting or our changing of light bulbs doesn't work anymore to help with the guilt, we turn to religion. I was in a class yesterday and the students started to get to some of this. Have you heard of the religion of the R's? Have you heard this? Refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. It's like this whole lifestyle. Have you given enough to your local ecologist and prayed your rosary? Have you done your vegan Hail Marys? Is your house passive? Some people will say, well, our house is all EVs. And some say, we only ride bikes. Some say, we don't even have vehicles. In fact, we don't even have a refrigerator. We just forge and eat whatever we can get. Don't, don't hear me say that's a bad thing, right? I know more than most and do more than most. I just want to point out that we cannot justify ourselves with works. That might sound familiar to some of you. So what are we doing? Can I invite you, SBU? Can I, can I witness to you the goodness of the Lord? Can I tell you that when ritual and religion fall away, what we have left of what is what was always there? Relationship. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with God like the Hebrews had in the desert, sustaining their material need day in and day out, all having enough. Surely that must be what Jesus wants for us when he teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Do you, do you make this connection here? He's superimposing a deeper meaning than just bread and quail and water. You get that, right? Like when we avert our eyes as forever chemicals pollute our water, that isn't bringing life and life abundant. It's bringing death. It's the opposite of living water. When we go on about our business as smog chokes the breath out of little asthmatic lungs, we aren't bringing life. We're bringing death. It's the opposite of the breath of life. And when we factory farm livestock to satiate an insatiable demand for meat, clear-cutting forests, trampling plains, causing suffering and harm. That isn't life. It's death. And it's probably worth remembering God's words to his people that the life of every creature is in its blood. But instead, too often, we listen to the voice of the enemy that profit is the lifeblood of our society. So how do we combat the worldview of the empire? You've been doing it. Lament. Lament and hope. Hope and Hope is God's response to lament, a living hope for resurrection. So I'm going to move towards our end here. I, I want to save some time for questions, but I want to bring it back to this of who cares. Like, seriously, SPU, who cares? Jesus does. Jesus cared when he was moved by the hunger of the masses when he taught. When his disciples suggested sending the people away, Jesus told his followers, you go feed them. Jesus cared when he taught that feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and visiting the sick and prisoner was doing for him. Jesus cared when he restored Peter after the resurrection, when he told him three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. 
feed my sheep. So yes, we lament. But our hope is in Yahweh, our salvation. Yeshua, Yahweh's salvation, that is Jesus. Jesus resurrected and in us. The light of the world is accessible here and now when we share our light because we are witnesses to these things. So here's where I'll end today, SPU. I didn't fly across the country to give a guest lecture. I didn't even come to give a chapel. I came to issue a call to arms. It's real, it's bad, it's us. Experts agree, but there is hope. We are creating a more healthy, equitable, resilient culture and economy. We can do it, I know we can. The only question we have is, can I get a climate witness? Thank you for your time. So I'm told we, we have a couple of, uh, Jeanette, you want to come back up and, and then we're gonna do some questions or you wanna do questions first? Yeah, you want to, we'll close in prayer. I'll close this in a quick word of prayer and then we do have some microphones to take some questions and a couple other things. I know you all gotta to get to class. Uh, yeah, let's turn our attention to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you. I thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, not time in the way that we sometimes think of it chronologically with that very fancy Greek word, chronos, but kairos time, Lord. That this pregnant moment, this moment of opportunity where your kingdom can break out and break in and break through our grief, our lament. Father God, we pray in this moment for your Holy Spirit. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your strength. We pray that we follow Jesus well and that we are witnesses to these things. Father God, we pray that whatever it is that you would have us do here on earth as it is in heaven, that we have eyes to see that and ears to hear that. That we provide a credible witness, not just to the next generation, but to those that don't even know Christ yet. We pray that we not be a stumbling block. We pray for restoration and rec reconciliation. And Lord, we look forward to resurrection in the power in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for being with us. And I want to give a shout out to Tori Goebbels. Wave in the back there, Tori. She is going to be, yes going to be out at a table if you have more information about EEN. And then I also just wanted to highlight that, as Marcus says, we are creating a more healthy, equitable, resilient culture. And here's some of the ways that I see it happening in my role as a sustainability manager here. And then some of the ways that you can be involved as well. Certainly, we have wonderful instructors here that integrate this into their classes. There's clubs. There's opportunities to enjoy creation. When we're lamenting, that can be a really important thing. And also many churches are working this on this, so I just encourage you to check out you know, what your denomination or diocese is doing. So with that, are there questions that you have? And I realize some of you need to go to class. Understand, go ahead. Um, but if there's questions, I think we've got a mic that can go around so folks can hear and... Yes, please, please do. Questions. Yeah, so questions, comments, concerns about what I do, what Tori does at YCA, about some of the information I gave today, or maybe even the scripture and how we handled it. I always want to be open to discerning together how we're handling scripture. I really appreciated all your, um, the Jesus emphasis of your talk. Um, and it's something that I noticed about EEN probably 15 or more years ago, is that when the argument about creation care, the argument started with all the Jesus passages, the cosmic Christ of Colossians, these sorts of things. And I, and I think that's fantastic. And I'm just wondering in your networking with other faith-based groups, Christian, Jewish, others, and, and, and other denominations, do you notice that that's still kind of a distinctive voice of EEN? And do you wish there was more of it? Or, or, or you're just... Everyone's doing fine on that. I'm, I'm just curious yeah. about the way you're communicating with all the Jesus stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question's about the use, and I did explicitly run first to a gospel account and then go to Paul. 
I work at the Evangelical Environmental Network. Most churches I go to, fortunately or unfortunately, spend most of their time in the Gospels and in Paul's epistles. Um, that is the lane we run in, and that's the voice we tend to use. And I was with some students yesterday in a class, and we, we talked about values-based messaging, right? So that's one piece of it. You use the values of the community you step into to talk about climate solutions. The other, though, is a being a trusted voice in the community. So you want to be one of the folks in the community that they can look to, not as I think we heard tree hugger, liberal, some of those those terms we heard earlier, uh, when I am able to fluently speak to the scriptures, the meta narrative of scriptures, and then how it centers and focuses in on Jesus to the community that I go to, it allows me a little bit more space to talk. Now, it is true that sometimes I find myself in a temple or at a mosque or somewhere else talking to people or at a gas station talking to someone, and I don't quite use that language. We use, uh, I talked about this earlier, environmental justice language, or I'll use racial justice language, and that's not because that language is better, it's just a language that they understand. And so that's usually, depending on the context I'm in, how I, uh, some of you might be familiar with the term code switch. It's simply code switching there. Good question, though. Others, questions, comments, concerns? All right, well, I'll give it another second. I'm comfortable in silence. Silence is important. But if there are no more questions, what I'll do is release us here in a second. We got one more question over there, Tori. Um, my question is about like affordability and sustainability of switching to environmentally mm -hmm. <laughs> sound products, right? It seems like in our area and everywhere, it's a sign of privilege that you can yeah. afford an electric car. It's a sign of privilege that you can switch from gas to electric heat. It's, you know, like there's a lot of that that we're kind of fighting with. Yeah. And we're, we're talking to students here, a lot of us, but... Um, I'm just curious what you would say to that. Like, what's a next step? What's a way to look at that? I know we've seen a lot more government grants to help with things, but and can you practically address that? Yeah, I, I can, actually. Um, so the, the question is a really good one about how do we overcome some of these obstacles, uh, both real and some perceived around economics of it or kind of uh, some solutions being identified with certain identities or something like that. I was in Professor Long's class yesterday for about two hours, and his students uh, essentially taught the class. Uh, so we, we talked through values and concerns and they came up with some climate solutions. And you'd be surprised that the answers were already in the room maybe. Uh, they talked about solutions like educating the community of folks that are dismissive or maybe disengaged. Uh, some of the wonderful solutions were around doing composting or meeting the community where they are with smaller projects or bigger projects. And so I think the answer to the question, and I talked about this a little bit in my talk, is less ritual or kind of like this way of life. Um, it's more relationship. And what I mean by that, if I can unpack it just a quick second, is that, again, I talk to evangelicals a lot, the relationship between Jesus and creation, and that it's for him and by him and through him, should color our relationship with creation and how we're living in it. So if we start with that relationship first, that changes how we live and then if we're living differently, we're doing things differently. And so if you're a student, that might be, I was talking to Jeanette about one of the highest uses of energy in some of the buildings are like just personal decisions, whether they be length of showers and heating rooms, like students have control over their personal decisions. But students can also come together to ask the administration to make changes. Uh, in that class yesterday, we were talking about some of those projects that fellows have done on campuses. And then we can band together larger circle from, you know, advocating with the administration to advocating locally with city and looking for policy change. So I think there's always something to do. And I'm not like hanging up on doing something. I think the big shift first, though, is changing our relationship and our mentality to one of away from consumption and to um, contentment. Contentment. I think that's probably a word we don't talk enough about in America, being content. Great question, though. Uh, maybe time for one more. I know you got to get to class. It's 12 o'clock. But maybe if there's one more question or concern or comment, we'll, we'll take that, and then we'll be done. Anything? So what gives you hope? What gives me hope? 
Oh my goodness, being here and seeing this room uh, with you all here gives me hope. I, I mentioned this yesterday in class, this is important. So I have a seven-year-old Ava and a four-year-old Isabella, and you know, we could throw up slides about the year 2050 and the year 2100. I'll say this, my four-year-old, right? If she lives to the average life expectancy of a woman in America, she'll see the end of this century, she will. And so what gives me hope is Isabella, right? And Ava too, but Ava, she's too much like me, she talks too much. But they give me hope because what I'm fighting for isn't a chart or a statistic, it's not anything like that, although I do wanna see temperatures come down. I'm fighting for my daughters, like this isn't a future threat. My daughters are here right now. Our younger siblings are here right now. Our children, our grandchildren, they're here, they're born already. And so this isn't a future off thing, it's a living hope that I have right now. Thanks for the question. And thank you for your time, SPU.